Okay, this will be our group problems for lecture exam four. We'll go through these one at a time and probably make two videos out of this. This will be the first one because we'll start with number one and see how that goes through. So the first question is looking at the partial pressure of oxygen and CO2 in various places and how that relates to the schematic. So let's kind of just look at these and go through them. Since it's not specified, uh, this will be for sea level and rest. Uh, so at sea level, the partial pressure of oxygen is about 159 millimeters of mercury. We can calculate that by using Dalton's law of partial pressure. So Dalton's law says that if we know the total pressure, since it's at sea level, it'll be 760. And we know the percentage of oxygen, since it's in our atmosphere, it's 20.93%. So 760 times 0 0.2093 is 159 millimeters of mercury. So that's the air we're breathing in. That's the partial pressure of gas. Remember, we put things in partial pressure units for gases because it's the partial pressure that drives the gas. And as we inhale that partial pressure at 159, it drops down from the alveoli to 105. If we were to get, going to show the chemical symbols for that, we'd say P capital A O2, right? So that's a subscript or a small capital A. Uh, means the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli. The capital A stands for alveoli. And that's about 105. And what happens is air gets diluted due to exchange. Oxygen is always leaving the alveoli, right? And going into the blood, so it becomes less than what it is in the atmosphere. Now, when oxygen in the alveoli comes across the pulmonary capillary, that is coming from the oxygen in the systemic, systemic circulation. It's about 40. So gas moves because of those partial pressure differences and gas diffuses into the pulmonary capillaries from the alveoli until it reaches 105. And that's due to Henry's law. Remember Henry's law tells us the partial pressure of a liquid, that's the blood, will equilibrate to that of a gas, that's the alveoli, that surrounds it. Since the alveolar pressure is 105, Henry's law tells us it'll come out of the capillaries at 105. If we were at altitude or some situation where the alveolar oxygen was only 60, then Henry's law would tell us it would come out at 60 in terms of the uh, pulmonary capillaries. Now, as the blood moves through the systemic circulation, it does drop to 100. It drops not because of gas exchange, but because of what we call the venous admixture. The venous admixture is a small amount of blood that doesn't have a whole lot of oxygen in it that mixes with the large amount of blood that has a fairly high content of oxygen. So that drops the oxygen content. So by the time it gets down to the capillary level, when it enters the systemic capillaries, it's dropped down to about 100. Since we're on the arterial side now, that's called P small a O2. The small a stands for arterial. So it's the partial pressure of oxygen in the arteries, right, that go to the capillaries. Once in the capillaries, our tissues are about 40. Okay, and they're 40 because they're using oxygen, right, now, since it's at rest, there's not a huge demand for oxygen like there would be during exercise, but certainly there is there is some some, and each tissue is different, obviously, but it's about the average we see. And so, as we come through the capillary at 100, and the tissues at 40, gas moves into the tissue from a high partial pressure in the capillary 100 to a low partial pressure in the tissue of 40, until it reaches 40 because of Henry's law. When it exits the capillary, we call that PVO2, partial pressure of oxygen in the veins. Okay. 
and that travels back to the pulmonary capillary where it enters again at 40 and we just repeat the process I just discussed. So one of the things to remember in terms of oxygen, because it's partial pressure that drives gases, the partial pressure has to be highest on the outside of the body so that we can get gas to the lowest point, in this, in this case oxygen, to the tissues. So we step down progression, 159, 105, 100, and then 40. We'll see the same thing is true for CO2, but it would be in reverse, meaning the CO2 in the tissues has to be the highest because we're removing CO2 from the body and getting it into the outside air. So it has to go from a high concentration of the tissue to the lowest concentration outside, and we'll kind of follow that. Uh, we are going to go in reverse direction, though, so we can keep the anatomical idea the same as we saw last time for oxygen. So this time we're going to do the PCO2, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, instead of PO2. So we're going to start with the ambient air. Remember, that's the room air, the air around us. Okay, And that's 0.3. Again, that comes from Dalton's Law. So we're still at sea level, so it's 760 millimeters of mercury times the uh, total percentage of CO2 in the room air is 0 0.035, 0 0.04%. So we go 760 times 0 0.0004, and that gives you about 0.3 millimeters of mercury, which tells us essentially there's very little carbon dioxide in the room air that we breathe. So as we inhale that small partial pressure of oxygen, it jumps up to about 40 and the whole reason why is the same that we saw in the oxygen but opposite so co2 is always leaving the capillaries and going to the alveoli whether we're inhaling exhaling or holding our breath that's always happening so the alveolar oxygen uh, sorry in this case alveolar co2 um, is going to be uh, about 40. so since it comes into the pulmonary capillary at 45 we have a higher partial pressure of CO2 in the capillary, a lower partial pressure of CO2 in the alveoli, and blood and blood uh, gas CO2 in this case diffuses from a high pressure to a low pressure, and it diffuses until it reaches 40. It reaches 40 because of Henry's law. Partial pressure of a liquid will equilibrate to that of a gas that surrounds it. As we move through the arterial tree, the P small a CO2, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the arteries, is about 40. And yeah, there's a venous admixture, but it's not enough to appreciably drop this number. We're going to worry about it. So we're just going to say it comes in the capillaries at 40. Now the tissues are at rest, and they're using oxygen and producing CO2 in their place. So 45 is not a bad number, although now some books are using 46. We're going to just keep us kind of, you know, these numbers that are you know, fives and zeros, so it's easier to remember. So we'll say 45, and it's going to diffuse into the capillary until it reaches 45 because of Henry's Law. So it comes out at 45 and then goes back in the lungs at 45. So we just keep on repeating this process again and again. And as long as we are ventilating, inhaling and exhaling, moving CO2 out of the body and oxygen into the body, this will keep on functioning normally. Um, without too much trouble. Now, <clears throat> you could draw a schematic if you wanted to, to answer that question, if you had a similar question on the exam, or you could do a table like this. It, it doesn't matter. And also remember, you would be responsible for rest at altitude and exercise at sea level, right? So, <clears throat> you know all those different scenarios. So that's the partial pressure of O2 and CO2. Uh, in the different places of the body and room air. So now we'll pick up with the different hormones that help maintain glomerular, glomerular filtration rate, or GFR. Now, we have a couple of different hormones, uh, and I'm going to divide them up into two questions. Uh, the first one asks about the antidiuretic hormone in renin-angiotensin activating system. Um, and you'll see why I put these two together. 
Uh, and that means that question number three would look at uh, the uh, aldosterone and ANH. And I put those together for a specific reason as well. And I think that hopefully as you study this, one will help support the knowledge of the other. So basically it asks about, you know, what's the role of ADH uh, and uh, kind of talk about what it does and everything. So we'll look at a couple different aspects of each one. So the first hormone in question was ADH, antidiuretic hormone, also known as vasopressin. As I mentioned before, if you know both names, you know the specific action. So the first thing I'm going to answer about each hormone is what's the specific action. So antidiuretic, that means not to pee, to retain water. So its main function is reabsorption of water, and that will increase blood volume and mean arterial pressure. Its second name, vasopressin, it means vessel pressure, tells us it's a vasoconstrictor. So it increases TPR and mean arterial pressure. So those are the two basic actions, reabsorption of water and vasoconstriction. Where does the hormone exert its effects? Well, for the reabsorption of water, it opens aquaporins of principal cells in the distal convoluted tubule. There's some in the collecting duct as well. And these aquaporins are those water channels we talked about. And if we open the water channels, those protein channels, water comes out of the ultrafiltrate and gets reabsorbed back into the body. The second thing it does is it directly affects vascular smooth muscle by stimulating what they call V1 receptors. That, those are vasopressin receptors. So that what uh, causes constriction. Where's the hormone made? This one's kind of complicated. Antidiuretic hormone is actually made in the hypothalamus, but travels through fast axonal transport to the posterior pituitary uh, and then gets released from there. It's primarily controlled by changes in osmolarity of blood, but there are other conditions that can affect it. So what other things do we kind of have to know about ADH? Um, it's actually a neurohormone because it's made in the hypothalamus, which is part of the brain. Uh, it increases the blood volume and promotes water reabsorption and also uh, causes ADH uh, to be released. All right. Um, by uh, uh, then eventually constricting the arterioles. There are other factors that could also affect ADH release, like severe hemorrhaging, which help retain water. And even during dehydration, uh, ADH will decrease sweat production. So there's a bunch of mechanisms which really just have our body hold on to water. Um, release of ADH is controlled primarily through the osmoreceptors. Uh, those are located in the hypothalamus. And remember, the hypothalamus is not related, it's not, um, not related, not covered by the blood-brain barrier. So it sees the blood directly and is in a position to measure osmolarity. Um, ADH is transported to the posterior pituitary, which is also known as the neurohypothesis. And then it's stored and eventually released from there. Um, ADH, right, can either increase or decrease the permeability of water in the late part of the nephron of the collecting ducts as well. There are a number of things that can change the ADH amount, pain, stress, trauma, anxiety, acetylcholine, nicotine, morphine, tranquilizers, and some anesthetics all stimulate increased ADH production. And if you increase ADH production, you're going to decrease the urine output. And so as an example, typically one of the things that people have to do before they leave a hospital after a major surgery is to make sure they can go pee. And part of that has to do with the uh, stimulation 
of uh, ADH production. And if you overstimulated ADH, right, you would not be able to pee much because you would retain so much water. So I want to make sure all that's normal before I let you go. Um, opposite of that is alcohol. Alcohol actually inhibits ADH secretion, which increases your urine output and is one of the major contributors to hangovers, actually, uh, because you have excessive urination and you become dehydrated. Um, diabetes insipidus, not diabetes mellitus, which is what we're talking about most of the semester, um, is a disease caused by the hyposecretion of ADH or the insensitivity of ADH uh, to V2 receptors on the principal cells. And that just means they don't respond to ADH. So uh, the big symptom is polyuria, right? So if you can't reabsorb water, then you're going to keep it in the tubules, which means it's going to come out as urine. And people with severe diabetes insipidus can pee 25 liters a day. It's one liter every hour. That's a lot of urine. Uh, in addition, not surprisingly, they also have polydipsia. Polydipsia is excessive thirst. We've seen that before. And if you're peeing 25 liters a day, obviously, you want to drink a lot to, to replace that. Um, but unlike diabetes mellitus, there's no sugar in the urine because it's not a problem with insulin and glucose. It's a problem with ADH. All right. Um, so that's the first hormone in this set. The second one is angiotensin and actually angiotensin 2, sometimes just known as AG or AG2. And get it there. That'll work. Um, we'll kind of go through the, the same idea and you'll see kind of the connection between the two and why I put them together. So what's the basic action of this hormone, angiotensin 2? Well, its job is to de decrease GFR by constricting the afferent arterial. So it is a vasoconstrictor which increases blood volume and increases blood pressure. Also, as a vasoconstrictor, it increases TPR and mean arterial pressure. So it's really got the same two effects of ADH, increases blood volume and increases TPR. Where does it exert its effects? Well, similar to uh, ADH, it has different receptors, but um, it causes constriction through the stimulation of angiotensin receptors, angiotensin 1 receptors actually, uh, in vascular smooth muscle. And in the hypothalamus, um, it causes release of ADH. Uh, where is the specific hormone made? Uh, this one's another complicated one. Angiotensin starts out uh, initially from the liver as proangiotensin, or sometimes known as angiotensinogen. When you use the pro term or the ogen term at the end, it means that it's an inactive precursor, normally physiologically speaking. So we have this angiotensin precursor called proangiotensin typically just floating around in the blood. And then uh, when it gets stimulated uh, by renin, right, to angiotensin 1, that's what the AG1 is, then it gets in the lungs typically stimulated to angiotensin 2. That's the most prolific hormone. That's the one that has the most action. So uh, the hormone uh, is controlled largely by renin. Uh, renin is the hormone that basically uh, controls the amount of conversion we have of proangiotensin to angiotensin 1. Because there's so much proangiotensin front around our blood, it's really limited by the amount of renin. Uh, once we release renin in the blood, it gets converted. And then in the lungs, it gets converted to angiotensin 2 by uh, ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme. And again, this is a, an important one, and you pay attention to the information with coronavirus, you'd see that uh, this is a point where the coronavirus actually is attaching to these receptors in the lungs, and uh, that might be part of the issue in terms of some of the uh, uh, respiratory issues they have there. Um,
sometimes this is known then as the renin angiotensin activating system or RAS uh, because of that complication. So how do we control angiotensin 2? Well, the justiglomerular cells, remember the, the, the JGA, uh, release renin in response to a variety of stimulations, but the big one is sympathetic stimulation. That'll directly increase the release of renin. Or the macula densa can do it through that tubuloglomerular feedback mechanism uh, we talked about when we talk, uh, discussed the intrinsic homeostatic mechanisms to control uh, GFR. Um, the angiotensin II is the most potent vasoconstrictor. Um, some studies show it's 40 times more potent than epinephrine, meaning to have the same level of vasoconstrictiveness, you would need 40 times the volume of epinephrine. Um, because of the constriction, it causes blood pressure release. It stimulates aldosterone, which is going to increase sodium retention and increase blood pressure and retain water. Um, it affects both the afferent and efferent arterial, but the afferent, just like we've talked about before, is much more sensitive because it has more receptors. GFR actually decreases because if you constrict the afferent more than the efferent, you'll have less filtration pressure and you'll have less blood being filtered into the glomerulus. Well, actually, in the Bowman's capsule, I guess, is the best way to say it. So if we have less water being filtered, there's more water effectively in the body. Um, so that's kind of how that works. Renin also um, can be uh, released uh, by uh, the reduced stretch of the JG cells, which indicates a lower blood pressure. Um, so there's a lot of different mechanisms that we can do. Um, angiotensin II uh, is a very potent hormone, and actually because it's such a powerful vasoconstrictor, uh, it is a point of control for hypertension medications now, and, and many of them actually affect that area where they're what they're called ACE inhibitors, where they inhibit the action of angiotensin converting enzyme, which then means we have less angiotensin II, so we have less of these very, very strong vasoconstrictors, so we get a net vasodilation, which means we're going to decrease mean arterial pressure. So those two go together. Now we'll look at the other two hormones. And the other two hormones I put together for a reason as well, and that's aldosterone and atrial natriuretic factor. The reason I put them together is they have antagonistic effects. They're opposite. One, aldosterone, retains water, retains sodium, increases mean arterial pressure, whereas ANH decreases water through the loss of sodium ions and decreases mean arterial pressure. So let's kind of look at kind of the big parts of them. So where is aldosterone made? Remember, this is the third water conservation hormone overall, right? Uh, sorry, what's its basic action? We'll do that first. So aldosterone will increase the reabsorption of sodium ions. And since we retain sodium, eventually water will follow because of its osmotic action. And that should raise mean arterial pressure by increasing blood volume. Uh, where does it exert its effects? Sodium increases the activity and or number of sodium reabsorbers in the ascending limb of the Lupa Henle. Remember, the ascending limb is permeable to water only. Sorry, the Lupa Henle is permeable to water only in the descending limb and permeable to only solutes in the ascending limb. So we can move sodium without the obligatory flow of water. Uh, some students get confused saying, okay, well, if I can move sodium without water, how do we increase the reabsorption of water? Well, sodium gets moved across the tubular lumen and put into the interstitial fluid around the various loops of Henle. Now, remember, there's a couple million uh, loops of Henle because there are a couple million functional nephrons when two kidneys about a million each. And so sitting right next to that one uh, ascending limb is another loop of Henle for another nephron. And we can exchange water from that. So even though it's not the same nephron that we pull water from, 
the net gain from the body is that we're increasing the, the blood volume within the body by retaining water. So um, it's not the same nephron, it's an adjacent nephron, but uh, overall it has the same effect. Um, aldosterone is made in the adrenal cortex. That's the outer portion of the adrenal gland. Remember, it sits right on top of the kidney. As a matter of fact, some places call it now the suprarenal gland, supra renal gland, which means on top of the kidney. Um, it's specifically made in the outermost layer called the zona glomerulosa. And it's released from a number of different things like a decrease in sodium. And that makes sense because it will increase sodium. A decrease in mean arterial pressure. That makes sense because it raises blood pressure. An increase in potassium. That one doesn't make a whole lot of sense unless you think about it. And release potassium and retain sodium in its place, so it's a way to get potassium out of our body. And we do the same thing with hydrogen ion as well. So if you had acidosis, you could do that as well. Um, because aldosterone is a steroid hormone, it uh, is a very slow-acting hormone. It affects the expression of genes and so it affects the rate of translation and transcription um, so it takes about 45 minutes to work um, it comes from the adrenal cortex uh, as we, we said before um, and uh, it controls the electrolyte and water balance by increasing the absorption of sodium and excretion of potassium usually uh, again, it helps prevent acidosis because we can excrete hydrogen ion as well um, in that case. Uh, it also affects the chloride concentration, bicarbonate concentration, and water as well. So it, it can get pretty complicated on what's exactly moving in what direction. And that's sort of why we didn't worry about chloride concentration like on the lab quiz, even though we measured it in lab. So that's aldosterone. Now, ANH is an antagonistic hormone, and so that means that uh, it will do the opposite. And there's a few minor details that you have to worry about, but for the most part, if you know one, you know the other. Uh, like I was mentioning with antidiuretic hormone or vasopressin, if you know the names, you know the action sometimes, and ANH is a great example of that. Uh, the basic action of ANH, right, is to decrease the reabsorption of sodium. So basically, we excrete more sodium um, than we usually do. Because sodium has an osmotic gradient, it pulls water with it, so it increases water excretion. And if we get rid of more sodium and water, we have a direct lowering of mean arterial pressure. Uh, a very recent report came out that indicated that it was the first report to show direct evidence that sodium itself is a vasoconstrictor. I've always thought that, and I don't teach it yet because I have not seen a, any follow-ups that supported that, but it never made sense to me that people who are sodium sensitive could have such a large response from a small amount of sodium in terms of their blood pressure going really high. Um, if it was just the osmotic action. So I think that, uh, you know, eventually we'll find uh, more evidence that sodium is a direct vasoconstrictor, which means it would also directly increase mean arterial pressure. So not just the effect of the water changes with sodium, but it would affect mean arterial pressure directly through TPR changes. But in this case, all we're worried about is the lowering of mean arterial pressure for sodium as we get rid of it with ANH, and then the obligatory water will get rid of so blood volume goes down as well. ANH uh, affects the same place that aldosterone does. It just does the opposite. So it decreases the activity and or number of the sodium reabsorbers in the ascending limb of the lupa henle. So more sodium and water are left in the tubules that eventually get excreted out. Um, the hormone is made, it's a great... Um, a name. Again, the uh, A stands for atrial, so it's made primarily in the right atrium, but also some in the left. Um, 
and they are released by excessive pressure or stretch in the atria, which would come from high blood volume or blood pressure, which means you'd want to lower that. Um, the natriuretic, remember sodium has the scientific name natrium, right? The atomic symbol for that is Na, right, for sodium. So natriuretic means like diuresis. Diuresis means to get rid of water, and natriuresis means to get rid of sodium. So again, it tells you, you know, where it's made and what it does, if you remember the name and, and, and what it means. So uh, ANH is primarily re released from the atrium when there's excessive, excessive stretch from increase in blood volume uh, or pressure. Um, it's also known as ANF for atrial natriuretic factor and ANP for atrial natriuretic peptide. And scientists argue about all these different things with it. But the bottom line is that uh, in any case, whether it's ANH, ANF, or ANP, it's talking about how we're getting rid of sodium and water through the excretion. Um, ANH uh, also increases GFR and suppresses the other water conservation hormones. Um, so that makes sense. Uh, it can reduce blood pressure and edema by causing increased water excretion. So again, if you remember aldosterone and ANH are antagonistic and you know one, you need, at least you know some of the factors uh, on the other one as well. So um, let's go ahead and, and cover this portion as well and then we'll move on to the next video uh, to finish the, the last couple questions. So number four group problems in lab, sorry, lab lecture exam four, ask about net filtration pressure and glomerular filtration rate. Uh, discuss the values below and calculate the various aspects of it. So you are given, uh, some values the glomerular hydrostatic pressure is 46 these are all millimeters of mercury uh, the glomerular oncotic pressure is 28 bowman's capsule hydrostatic pressure is 7 and bowman's capsule oncotic pressure is 0. remember oncotic and osmotic can be used interchangeably um, oncotic refers particularly to the pressure of proteins but within the kidney since everything gets filtered through except for the proteins if they're dissolved in fluid in the plasma. Um, the only difference is proteins. That's why we call it oncotic pressure. So the net filtration pressure uh, is the pressure that causes the filtration. And remember, it's directly proportional to GFR. If we increase the net filtration pressure, GFR goes up. If it goes down, GFR goes down. So that is highly regulated. It is determined ultimately by the startling forces since the glomerulus is really just a capillary. It's a filter, but it's also a capillary. So to figure out what happens in terms of this, we have to figure out the net filtration pressure. There are two positive factors that favor filtration that basically push fluid or pull fluid out of the capillary into Bowman space. That's the glomerular hydrostatic pressure. That's very closely related to blood pressure. Uh, for most people, it's between 35 and 55. And also the capsular oncotic pressure. That's the pressure due to proteins in the capsular space. It's usually zero because normally there should be no proteins that get filtered through. We can't totally forget about it because there are pathologies where proteins can get filtered through and then that would affect GFR. So we have to kind of weigh the filtration aspects with the reabsorption aspects. And there are two factors that favor reabsorption. The capsular hydrostatic pressure, that's the pressure that pushes back on the glomerulus, usually due to the pressure of fluids in the capsular space it's usually small because once the ultrafiltrate is made it either gets reabsorbed or goes in the proximal convoluted tubule but in either case it's not there pushing back on the capillary the largest force for reabsorption though is the glomerular oncotic pressure that's the pressure due to proteins uh, this value is uh, typically around 25 and 
um, you know, all the proteins stay in the cardiovascular system, so it's fairly high, especially at the distal end of the glomerular capillaries since we've lost water, but there's been no loss of proteins. So here's one of the formulas you should know for the exam, NFP, net filtration pressure, equals GHP plus COP. So those are the two factors that favor filtration, glomerular hydrostatic pressure and capsular oncotic pressure. From that, we will subtract CHP plus GOP. Those are the two uh, factors that favor filtration, uh, sorry, reabsorption in this case, reabsorption. Um, that's the capsular hydrostatic pressure and glomerular oncotic pressure. So going from our numbers we got up here, GHP is 46 plus COP is 0, right? Minus CHP is 28 plus GOP is 7. So we put those in the formula, 46 plus 0 minus 7 plus 28. We get a positive 11 for net filtration pressure. We said most people are between about 11, sorry, 11, 10, and 20 for NFP. So NFP directly determines GFR. Our GFR, remember, is about 125 mils per minute. And it's directly proportional to uh, GFR in terms of NFP. So any change in NFP will influence GFR. Now, GFR is homeostatically regulated, it doesn't change much, and since NFP directly determines GFR, it doesn't change much either, okay? So normally NFP doesn't change much because it affects GFR. So what are some of the factors that can change to affect the GFR? Uh, it is a homeostatically regulated variable. It's regulated intrinsically and extrinsically. And we talked about at least extrinsically how it's regulated by hormones in previous questions, All right? So some of the things that would affect potentially our GFR is blood pressure. Uh, remember that the major uh, factor that determines uh, GFR is the glomerular hydrostatic pressure or GHP. Remember that's closely related to blood pressure, but the kidney has this amazing ability to auto-regulate blood pressure within the glomerulus. So as long as the mean arterial pressure is between 50 and 150, that's our magic number, that's called the regulated range, right? Any changes in pressure in the glomerulus can be compensated by changes in arteriolar diameter. So that means that as long as the mean arterial pressure stays between 50 and 150, we're not going to affect uh, net filtration pressure at all, which means GFR is not going to change either. Uh, other factors that could affect how uh, GFR works is capsular hydrostatic pressure. That's the back pressure pushing against the fluid coming out of the glomerulus. Um, as an example, one of the primary places this would happen would be an obstruction would cause a decrease in, in, in that as the capsular pressure, hydrostatic pressure went up, then the GFR would go down. Um, and then the plasma oncotic pressure, the, the proteins within the blood play a role. And uh, if you change them and increase them or decrease them significantly, that could affect uh, different uh, varying aspects of GFR. So they're pretty important. And to be honest, they don't change much either. That's one of the reasons why GFR stays so constant. So in this last portion, what we were supposed to do is we were supposed to take these different uh, situations and apply some answers to that. So as an example, uh, we get a situation where uh, in someone who's severely hemorrhaging, the mean arterial pressure drops from 93 to 31. All right, so the first question you ask yourself is, okay, my mean arterial pressure is changing, but is it in the regulated range? Is it between 50 and 150? In this case, the answer is no. So no, we can no longer regulate blood pressure from that standpoint. 
once it drops below 50. So since the mean arterial pressure went to one third exactly from 93 to 31, it will have a significant effect on GFR. Since GHP goes down, then uh, the uh, glomerular hydrostatic pressure goes down, then NFP will go down as well. And if NFP goes down, GFR will go down. Okay, so that's that one. Uh, here in B, someone's exercising and their mean arterial pressure goes from 106 to 138. All right, one that shouldn't happen, so there's not really that's not really good. But if it did, GFR is not going to change. And the reason why is you ask the same question. Yes, their blood pressure went up, but we started in the regulated range, we finished in the regulated range, which means there should be no change in GFR because we have this ability to auto-regulate between 50 and 150. So in this case, GFR is essentially unchanged. Uh, in C, you have somebody who's malnourished where blood proteins drop from eight grams per deciliter to four. Since the blood proteins went in half, right, we're gonna look and we're gonna say, okay, the plasma oncotic pressure is gonna go down. Uh, we have less proteins in our blood, which means we're going to pull less fluid back from the capsule, which means GFR is going to significantly increase. So GFR goes up in this case, uh, number C, and letter C. And in letter D, an experimental drug uh, destroys the podocytes and the filtration membrane. So remember the podocytes are there primarily as a selective uh permeable substance that allows some things to get through but some things to stay in the blood if we lose that then we lose the selectivity of things so what's going to happen is you know two major things one proteins that should be in the blood are no longer there which means that's going to increase the uh, re increase the amount of fluid that stays in the capsule in addition the proteins that have left are now actually in the capsule themselves and they're pulling water with it. So you have a double whammy. You're removing proteins from the capillary and putting those proteins in Bowman space. And in both cases, that's going to increase the amount of water that leaves the capillary. So GFR will increase dramatically if something like this happened. So that'll do it for this section of the video and we'll pick up the last couple questions in the next one.